Hi, welcome everybody. My name is Brady Granger and I co-chair the CANS Special Interest Group for Clinical Nurse Scientists in the Practice Setting with Mary Fran Tracy. And today we are uh, continuing a series that was started in 2020 about the roles of nurse scientists in clinical settings and how nurse scientists work in practice settings to advance nursing science. So today we have a guest speaker that I would like to introduce who is a longtime friend and colleague, Dai Wai Olson. He is a professor at UT Southwestern and I'll just give you a, a second of background, although it's hard to fit Dai Wai's background in, in a second. But he began his career in the 80s in Iowa and practiced uh, for over 30 years as a staff nurse in the neuro ICU setting. He obtained his PhD at UNC uh, in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and was an assistant professor here at Duke, uh, uh, which is where I came to know Dai Wai and, and have the chance to work closely with him. He has been at UT Southwestern now since 2012, where he has achieved the status of the first full professor uh, awarded at that university and continues his work in the neuro uh, department, helping to achieve uh, advances in nursing science with the staff there. In the process of his uh, work, he has been incredibly uh, prolific and made huge contributions to the profession. He has published over 250 papers helping nurses understand how their, their work and care contributes to patient outcomes. He has uh, become editor-in-chief for the Journal of Neuroscience Nursing. He is co-chair of the International Neurocritical Care Research Network. And he has uh, worked and presented in 39 states in the U.S., 10 countries, and five different continents. So. I am honored uh, to have him present to us today on a topic that will help us, I think, as a special interest group to, to build and use registries in our practice of advancing nursing science. So welcome, Dai Wai, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Brady. Thanks for the introduction. I'm, this is a, a topic that's pretty near and dear to my heart, and I'm excited. So let's jump on in. This is about building and running a nurse-led registry. We've all heard about registries. Typically, um, most commonly, they're run by someone other than a nurse, and I think that's not a good idea. These are my disclosures. Neuroptics and Department of Defense are probably relevant to the content I'm going to talk about today, um, but I will make every effort to be impartial, and I think you'll see I do that pretty well. The focus of my work for the past 25 years has been that I think nursing is important. I think nursing makes a difference. I think nurses make a difference. And so far, nobody has stood up to me and told me I'm wrong. However, what do we really mean by that? And I warn everybody right off the bat, I'm going to get into statistics right from the get-go. And I know some of you are having PTSD right now, but we're going to get through this together. The first thing that comes to mind when we talk about stats is the famous regression formula. And I, and, and, and I know I've triggered things with some of you. This is read pretty simply. This formula of funky letters is the outcome is predicted by where we started plus the influence of a bunch of variables plus error. I'm gonna break that down a little bit differently. This is the same formula and I'm gonna color code it for us. The outcome is Y, the letter Y. It's predicted by, this, this pink color is the equal sign. Where we started, that's that, that beta naught. All those B1, X1s, the beta 1, X1, beta 2, X2, that's variables. The plus signs are plus, and the little weird looking E is error. So we can map this that the outcome is predicted by where we started plus the influence of a bunch of variables plus error. I'm going to give an example and I'm going to use a neuro example because I'm a neuro nerd. We're going to think that the 90 day modified Rankin score is predicted by how well the patient was before they had a stroke 
plus their NIH score, plus their age, plus whether or not they got alta place, plus sex, plus a bunch of other stuff that we didn't happen to measure, and then error. And you can see on the bottom, that's just discharge, modified rank then is baseline. How were they before their stroke? Plus the variables plus error. Now, I'm gonna focus in for a second on the other stuff, because a lot of the times we talk about all the other stuff, the random variables, and we act like that can be controlled for by randomization. My argument is the other stuff is me. I'm the, I'm the other stuff. I'm, you know, the bedside nurses. We're the other stuff that didn't get measured. And the question is, do we make a difference? That takes me back to that initial question. Did we make a difference? And you can measure a lot of these variables. And this is the same formula laid out a little bit different. Let's take that stroke. And then we've got a bunch of variables. And our intervention is whether or not the patient got all to place, TPA. And typically, we get these little r squareds that explain a proportion of the variance. And if you add all of them together, you can see that in my hypothetical example, the intervention plus the known variables, age, NIHSS, sex, can tell us about 70% of the proportion of variance in why a patient has a good outcome or a bad outcome. And then nursing is just lumped in with confounders. Well, it's probably lumped in with confounders because we don't really know how to measure it. Now, there's other stuff that's lumped in with confounders too. We can measure an awful lot of things. We don't measure everything that's possible because some of the things we think are important and some of the things we think are not important. I think nursing care is important, so I think we should measure it. And when we theorize what we do and don't measure, we have to start thinking about how did all of this come about? See, there's that theory word. First, I hit you with statistics, then I throw out the theory word. A lot of you are, are, are really kind of getting those heebie-jeebies. Well, statistics and theory are hand in hand. Originally, we had a belief, not a theory, a belief. We believed that the gods caused us to be sick. And then they developed theory. They had a theory that there were four things blood, yellow bile, yellow bile, black bile, phlegm. And those four things together explained how we got sick and they, they explained disease. Well, they started testing these theories. And by testing these theories, they realized, yeah, this whole uh, four humorous theory, that didn't work out. There has to be a different cause for disease. But we had already moved beyond rejecting that disease was simply by gods. So medicine started out as very theory-based, and oddly enough, in the past 100 years or so, it's become a little bit less theory-based. It's not really as theory-based as it was, whereas nursing has become more theory-based, especially after World War II. Now, in nursing school, in my undergrad, when I had to do my theory class, oh, I hated theory. I hated theory. And then I became a nurse theorist, and now I like theory. <laughs> Odd how that happens. Here's my theory. This is called the Q response theory, and this applies specifically to patients with brain injury. Um, we're not going to go over this real in depth, but you'll see how it applies to why I now have a registry. Imagine that a patient has an event. They get hit in the head with a baseball bat. That causes a brain injury. The brain injury results in impaired brain function. Then nurses, we have things we have to do. These are called interventions. And we watch the patient, we observe, we look at them, we check their vitals. Those become cues. And we interpret those cues to decide when things should happen. And deciding when something should happen becomes as important as deciding what should happen. And I think this is part of the essence of what nurses do at the bedside. This is that critical thinking. And I'm gonna give you two quick examples. The first one is a bad outcome. So ICP is intracranial pressure. We put a tube in someone's uh, skull and we measure the pressure inside their brain. Big numbers are bad. An ICP of 32 is seen in this patient 
and a brand new nurse comes into the room and says, oh my gosh, they had a poo, I better clean it up. So she lowers their head of bed, she cleans the patient, she rolls them from left to right, puts, puts on new sheets, looks up, the ICP is now gone from 32 to 56, the patient herniates and they die. That's a bad outcome. And we can directly link that something the nurse did, this one action the nurse did, led to a bad outcome. The reason that's important, if a nurse, if nursing care can cause a bad outcome, then a nurse and nursing care can also cause a good outcome. So by proving the negative or by pushing the negative, I think I can demonstrate that there's a reasonable assumption that nursing can lead to good outcomes. We'll take the same patient, different nurse, ICP is 32. This nurse walks in, says, oh my gosh, look at that, patient had a poo. But more importantly, one of the cues they're giving me is their ICP is 32. That's intracranial hypertension. I'm going to raise their head of the bed instead of lower it. I'm going to contact my NP. The NP is going to order some mannitol. And I'm going to wait until the ICP is back down to 12. Then I'm going to clean the patient. And my patient is going to move on a trajectory towards recovery. The thing is, it's kind of hard to measure that. So that has led me to look at what kind of cues in neuro can I assess that help me determine when something should happen. And not only me, but other nurses, because if I can measure this, maybe I can figure out the R squared, the proportion of variance in outcome that can be explained by good nursing. This is where I became interested in pupillometry. I'm interested in pupillometry because of, of the above. You should be interested in pupillometry because as I'm gonna show you, Pupillometry is nothing more than objective data. And if I give you bad data, if I tell you bad data about the pupils, it's very hard for you as an advanced practice provider to make a good decision. Brief review of, of neuroanatomy. Yeah, I know statistics and theory, now neuroanatomy. What a sucky lecture, right? So this is a 30,000 foot view, the easy, easy thing. And we're going to look at afferent, interneuron, and efferent. Essentially, what happens is light hits the eye. That signal travels along the second cranial nerve to something called the Edinger-Westphal nucleus, where the EW sends a signal back to both eyes and causes those pupils to constrict. That's the basic pupillary light reflex. And that's going to be important because we're going to talk about this. All of you have, have taken a flashlight and looked at a PLR. Here's my hypothetic. You are the APP taking care of a patient and you get a call at five minutes after two o'clock in the morning. Miss Brown isn't doing well. And this nurse starts to tell you the assessment. And in part of that assessment, the nurse says, oh yeah, the pupils are equal round brisk at three millimeters. Then you double check. You talk to the, the resident who happens to be on. The resident says, yeah, they're pearl because he's cool, so, you know, he'll just use the acronyms. If I tell you that the patient's pupils are equal, round, and reactive at three millimeters, in 2018, I would agree with you if you said you have an understanding of whether or not the patient has an intact pupillary light reflex, and in 2019, you don't know squat about how well the patient's pupils are working. And that's the cool part that drove me to this registry. registry. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is a, a study that we did. And this data is not in my registry. This is the data that made me think, damn, we need a registry. And I didn't have IRB approval to keep this in. But what we did is we looked at 2,329 paired observations. In other words, just about 5,000 observations of two different eyes. And we wanted to know if I look at this patient's pupils and you look at this patient's pupils, will we get the same assessment? Now, right now, all of you are going, you know, I did this for years and years and years. And I remember looking at this patient and going, well, I think they're three millimeters. I'm, not, I'm gonna ask somebody else. 
And that person agreed with you if they liked you, and they disagreed with you if they didn't. And then you go, are they are they reactive? I'm not sure. Are they reactive? And you double check and it's pointing your eyes like that's going to help you, right? And it turns out here's the data, and we're not going to go over this whole spreadsheet, but it's on there. Um, we agree a lot. We agree a lot. There's a problem to that. So on the size of the pupil, we agree about 80%. That's not too bad. Eight out of 10 times we disagree on how, how big or small the pupil is. On whether or not the pupil's round, isn't that weird? We can't even agree on what they're, whether they're round, except 95% of the time. But reactivity, 80% of the time we agree, which means one out of five times we disagree on whether or not it's reactive. But agreement is not the correct statistic. Agreement is not the correct statistic because if I randomly asked you and you didn't go into a patient's room, you don't even look at the patient's room, and you say, I bet that that patient's pupils are four millimeters in diameter, they're round and they're brisk, you'd be right 95% of the time without even looking because 95% of the time, that's how it is, right? So what we need instead is something called a Kappa statistic, which is much more robust for looking at this because we're looking at rare events. And now when we did our Kappa statistic, it turns out humans suck at judging pupils. That's because the pupillary light reflex is so fast. We got a kappa of 0.4, which is poor, on whether or not the pupil is reactive. And I will share with you, we did this with physicians, we did this with nurses, we did this with two nurses, two physicians, one nurse, one physician, APP, and we did every combination. And we couldn't get but about half the time on the patients with fixed pupils that, that they agreed. And we had at least two people judge a patient who had a prosthetic eye as having a reactive pupil. So humans aren't very good at this. That was the key. That was the key to this registry. As we were starting the registry, we wanted to make sure that what we were seeing was not a phenomenon specific to just, you know, the, the neuro ICU and floor patients. So this is Lillian Umbro, and uh, she did a study in PACU and found exactly the same thing, that humans are not very good at looking at pupils. And so we found this device called a pupillometer. And the movie that you're seeing off to the side is a pupillometer assessment. Basically, you target the pupil, and there is a high-speed camera that takes really fast images of, of the pupil, and it scores how fast your pupil gets big or small. Now, the really cool thing too is you can see on that, you could see the pupil getting small. And here, uh, Danielle is showing us the values. What you're looking at in the graph is variables you never heard of before pupillometry. There is a period of time between when the light goes on and when the pupil starts to react it's about one-tenth of one second to three-tenths of one second. The human cannot judge that. Then there's the speed. There's how fast does it get small? We used to call this brisk and sluggish and stuff. And then there's how fast does it come back to normal? And is it different if it gets big or small from different baselines? And the answer is yes. And we said, well, if we're going to start looking at all these variables, we need to come up with a registry. So I started this registry and this gentleman who you can see trying to win an ugly sweater Christmas contest by wearing an ugly suit said the first thing we better do is also in this registry, make sure that even though two humans get a different answer, do two devices get a different answer? So we did an inter-device reliability study and it turns out that kappa is 0.97. And the 0.97, it was 100 point 0.1 or, or 1.0 for whether or not the pupil was fixed. So this is 0.97 on, on the uh, NPI, which is uh, an overall assessment. All right, so here's where we're at. Humans, we're not very good at judging 
judging uh, pupillary light reflex, which really is no different than anything else we've done. We used to check temperature by putting our hands on a forehead, right? And we'd say fever, no fever, right? And kind of judge it. Um, we used to judge their blood sugar. Uh, a lot of us have been around where we had the where we had the tape where you tipped in and you checked the color, right? And you figured out how much insulin they needed by the color of the paper. And then we became metered. We have a pulse oximeter that is more accurate than squeezing their pinky and looking at their lips. We have a thermometer that is more accurate than feeling their forehead. We have a pupillometer that is more accurate than looking at the pupil. And we started something called the end panic establishing normative data for pupil pupillometer assessments in neuro ICU. We started the end panic registry with neuro ICU because we thought that was our bread and butter. We have sites in Japan, California, Texas, Ohio, Pennsylvania, and Germany. This is entirely nurse run and nurse led. We have over 5,500 patients in this registry, 90 variables, and over 6 million assessments. We have a large registry. But the first step in this registry was we're not going to write the methods every time we do a paper. I'll cut to the chase. We're on paper number 29 of this registry. We're not going to write the methods. So the very first thing we did was wrote a fairly extensive methods paper of how does, how does data get from the patient into the registry. And this is our methods paper. And I encourage you, if you're going to do a registry, do a methods paper because we're, we cite this every time and it saves us like, like 20 paragraphs. We also have described a methods for how we clean the data and how we manage the data. How uh, This is an ongoing registry. It's not a one time only. In fact, I got another uh, data dump just last week from Japan. So there, that next chunk of data needs to go into the registry. So I've got about another uh, 200,000 observations to get in. And how do you do that? And you need a rigorous process and, and this talks about that. We also wanted to set the baseline. We have from the company, they have described what normal means. But no one's done that outside the company and we wanted something something unique and private and, and separate. So, so this is a paper that set the norms, right? So this is the distributions, reference ranges. That means if I check on a patient, a normal patient who's healthy, I'm going to get a, an NPI of about 4.2. And their pupil is going to be about three and a half millimeters in size. Latency, how long it takes from that light to go on until their pupil starts to react is about three tenths of a second. The velocity, how many millimeters per second that pupil gets smaller is 1.6 and their dilation velocity is 0 0.7, a little bit slower. So that's an important piece. Then we started really digging into the data. And this is, this is the paper that has convinced all of us that 10 years from now, you will not use a flashlight. In fact, we're done with flashlights. There is no reason to be using a flashlight or a pin light. First off, you're not very accurate. We showed that with our first paper. We've shown that repeatedly with, with the registry. This was our other aha moment. I got called down to the intensive care unit by one of my residents who was really pissed off at me because he hated the pupillometer. And the pupillometer said that the patient had an abnormal pupil reflex, but he could see the pupil was really brisk and, and that he was just upset. And, and at first I didn't really understand it. But then with the help of uh, Ife Shuyambo, we did a, a fairly complicated analysis that was picked up by Nature Scientific Reports. And now it makes sense to me. Both of the cars that you see are going brisk. Both of these cars are brisk. They're really, really fast. One of these cars, and I think you can picture which one, is not functioning normally. So 
just being brisk doesn't mean everything's working okay. The best example we picked out of this is, imagine the patient with a pupil that's eight millimeters round, big old pupil, and you shine a light in that eye and that pupil goes from eight millimeters really quickly down to six and a half millimeters. Well, that's brisk, but if that pupil only goes down to six and a half millimeters, there's something wrong. That's not normal. And then what about the dilation? What if it doesn't dilate again? Or what if it dilates super fast or super slow? So we're digging more into this and um, we've got some exciting uh, data to share in probably in about six months. So I'm, I'm super excited. There's even more coming out. This is why if the nurse calls you at three in the morning and says their pupil is brisk, you still don't know if it's normal. You don't know if your patient's okay. And a slow pupil might not be abnormal. That's the other cool part. Slow pupils are not necessarily abnormal. Because intracranial pressure is so part and parcel to the intensive care unit, and because of my other work with nursing, um, we did a study uh, where we replicated work by Dr. Molly McNett out of Ohio. She found an association, and uh, Molly's also a nurse, um, she found an association between intracranial pressure and pupillometry. So we checked it, you know, we're all taught to do these replication studies, but then you never really see them. Um, we did it, we did a replication study. Uh, we managed to publish in Critical Care uh, Explorations, which is a strong journal, super happy about that. Found exactly the same thing as Molly. So it's becoming more robust. The picture you see in the upper uh, corner there is Salah Aoun, he's a neuro neurosurgeon, and he hated me and he hated pupillometry, hated us. And I started this registry and oh, I got so much flack from him. And he wanted to prove that this thing was a piece of crap. So I said, all right, let's design the study. And we did, we looked at his subarachnoid hemorrhage patients and uh, it turns out the pupillometer the findings on the neuropupillary index are strongly correlated with the delayed cerebral ischemia, which is a precursor to, to, uh, to neuro changes. In fact, we see them up to eight hours. You see changes in the pupil up to eight hours before you see changes in the neuro exam. So he has gone from hating pupillometry to now he's doing uh, concussion research and TBI research. This is Stephanie uh, Ortega Perez from Columbia, South America. And uh, she came up and did a study with us on pupillary light reflex as a predictor of outcomes from subarachnoid hemorrhage. This is modified Rankin score. Robust um, patients whose pupillometry values go up and down and up and down and up and down. These are the unstable patients. Even if their, their GCS is stable, even if everything else is stable, patients who's, who have high variability in their pupil scores have a, a worse outcome, which is kind of a neat little finding. Uh, this was a, a correlation between shift, how much shift in the pupil there is uh, off of midline, and that's in stroke patients. This was eye color. This was a gentleman named Sam Alibide. Uh We were challenged that uh, Pupillometry would be different based on the color of your eyes. And so we looked at that and it turns out, nope, no difference based on eye color, you're just fine. Um, so we don't have to look at eye color. Uh, again with Salah, uh, he's now, we looked at in traumatic brain injury patients, if your pupillometer is normal, you're gonna, you're, you're, you're solid, but you can see an NPI change in these patients up to 12 hours before symptoms. And unfortunately we found this out the hard way where uh, we had a patient who had pupillometer changes and, and we told the resident who didn't do anything, four hours later there were worse changes, he didn't do anything and four hours later, unfortunately the patient passed. So we learned a lot, we reported that case study. 
another study with uh, Dr. Weir Kuhn, most of you have heard of Horner syndrome and uh, pupillary light reflex is part of Horner syndrome. And after endarterectomy where they're stretching that carotid plexus, you, you can uh, mess up the sympathetic parasympathetic and that's where you're seeing uh, pupillometry changes there. So it's nice to see that the physiology works. This was for traumatic brain injury. Patients who had normal NPIs did not require surgery. This was 100% sensitive and specific, rocking the world of neurosurgery on this because it's got a higher predictability than the Glasgow Coma Score. So in other words, now you've got an objective measure that you can put the, in the hands of a, of a paramedic or someone on the field, which is why my DOD conflict. So you can put it in the hands of a medic uh, looking at soldiers. You don't want the soldier in the middle of the field do, you know, do pronate or drift and stuff like that. You can look at their pupils and help triage. So this is pretty cool stuff. These are a couple of other papers that we've got going. And what I'm trying to share with you is that the development of this registry, you can see a lot of these questions. These are nursing questions, right? How, how does what I do, how does my assessment ultimately influence care? And how does the accuracy of my assessment, I'm better, I'm more on target, I'm more accurate. How can that make a difference in the patient outcome? And now we're seeing like up to 12 hours difference. So huge, huge. These are a couple of papers. Uh, both of these have been accepted now and they should be coming out in uh, early January. As I'm speaking now, it's still December. Uh, so the question has been sort of answered for us. It's no longer a question of will we continue to use flashlights. It's no longer a question of if we'll use pupillometer. We've, we've seen that. Now we have a whole new set of questions. How often should we check? When should we, when should we call? What kind of biomarkers? What kind of patients? And all of these are questions that because we took the time to build this registry from the get-go, we can be asking these questions. And um, I think that's my 30 minutes. And I will be uh, logging on. I look forward to your questions. This is my email. Uh, please uh, feel free to send me some comments. Thank you very much for listening. Sure. Hi, Brady. Oh, great. Hi, Dai Um, I'm wondering if, if are we open to everybody? I wonder if we could unmute everyone and um, take questions. First, I just want to say thanks, Dai I I appreciated and really enjoyed listening to your talk when we did the recording, and it was even better the second time around. So. <laughs> Thanks so much for, for your time and for doing that. Um, there are a couple of questions in the box and I wanna start off, maybe Mary Fran, you wanna ask your question? Yeah, I, I do that. All by yourself? Um, I don't know if she's, if Mary Fran is muted or not. Uh, oh. she, first off, thank you for the, presentation. I appreciate that. Uh, and can I talk about the structure, resources, and finances of the registry? Um, I'm trying to turn my video on, Brady, but I I'm guess I could. to also, but okay. it won't. Well, maybe they thought we were not good to look at, so they changed it. Um, I also noticed that there's some questions in the chat feature. So, I'm, I'm Brady, maybe we can go to both places. So, um, Mary Friend, this is a good question. The structure, resources, and finances. We're operating fairly slim, and um, we do get about 30 grand a year from Neuroptics. And I disclosed early on that, um, that they provide some funding. 
30,000 is not much money. It's certainly not enough to do the 29 uh, papers we've had. And now we've got two more uh, in the hopper. So uh, I've been fortunate that I run the Neuroscience Nursing Research Center and two of the local universities that we work with have INSPIRE interns. These are engaged nursing students participating in the research experience um, and they help us with some data collection. I also have nurses and uh, mostly in the neuro ICU, but some on neurosurgical step down that uh, because of our clinical ladder, they're motivated to do a research study and write a paper. And so we've got some stuff through that. The rest of this initially was um, skimming off of other resources that I had. I had some startup money when I first came to UT Southwestern. Um, and so at the initial, this was all, you know, using my own money and putting it together and a little bit of money from Neuroptics. Uh, I now have some funding through DOD. Uh, once we got a better database, we were able to start writing grants. Unfortunately, as most of us know, a lot of the nursing grants with exception of NIH are hey, write this 470 page grant application and we'll give you $175. Um, so we're, so as nurses, especially at the, at the bedside, we're, we're underfunded um, and we can make a lot of difference. So that's a bit of, bit of my high horse. Uh, Brady. I didn't mean to interrupt your answer. I, I, I was just trying, I was laughing because yeah, I agree. There's a. There we go. Hi, everybody. Oh, great. How did you do it? I'm a genius. No, um, uh, Rachel gave me. Uh, uh, Thanks, Rachel. Somehow Rachel fixed it. Rachel James fixed it. I can't take any real credit. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I was just laughing because it's, I don't know why we can't. Uh, we can't seem to rise up from the problem, but I think we should focus today on the positive and the amazing job that you've done in putting the registry together and then telling a story that the rest of us can really learn from and appreciate. Uh, there are a couple of other questions that are coming up in the box, and I'm not sure if you can see them, but the next, how do you recruit for the registry and then do you so, want to say anything more? Yeah, let me, let me start with that one from Mary Lowe. Okay. Um, the, in terms of, of the registry, we have IRB approval to uh, get most, most of the data we get is from the electronic, electronic medical record. We're getting huge data dumps. Um, the smart guard data, uh, we're also able to pull and then we have to de-identify it. So we're not consenting for this particular registry. And that surprised me. Um, 15 years ago, when I was at Duke with, with Brady, I worked on the Get With The Guidelines statistical analysis team. And most of us work at universities that, that participate in the Get With The Guidelines stroke registry. None of these patients are consented. And um, the data has to be completely de-identified, retrospective. And there's other rules, you know, you have to not be able to get it without um, uh, without consent. And also that in our case, if we consented the patient, the only thing linking the data to the patient would be the consent. So we're basically getting a bunch of, of de-identified data from the EMR. And um, we link that with a subject ID number that we make up in-house. The hospitals um, external to us in, in Germany, Japan, uh, California, Ohio, and, and Pennsylvania, they send us subject ID numbers only. And then so when we, when we report this, it's very anonymous because we say, you know, the average age was 57. You have no idea even what country these patients were from. <laughs> So that's pretty de-identified. So we're actually getting every single patient that goes into the intensive care unit. So that's why I have about 6,000 patients in the registry. That's great. 
can I ask a related question? That 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 explains a, a lot, I think, about recruiting patients or subjects in the registry. But what about recruiting um, studies? There's another question uh, related. How do you recruit? Uh, or Mary Lou's question, I guess. How do you recruit for studies? I think that's referring to ah. the multiple studies that you have. How do you? So it's 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 been quite interesting. When I first proposed this this registry, as so many of us have, we think, you know, I got a really good idea, and we talk <laughs> about it. And um, and you propose this thing, so I propose this registry, and everybody's like, yeah, whatever, I don't care, it's stupid, I'm not doing nothing, I'm not helping anyone, right? And then I started publishing papers, and then we've got a, a data set, and then all of a sudden people are like, so. Can I, can I? How can we play? Yeah, I, it, <laughs> it, it looks like it looks like you know. I mean, I've got uh, no offense to my physician colleagues, but I've got these twelve physicians telling me, you know, hey, medical resident or nurse, spend seventeen years collecting this data, and I'll include your name at the very bottom of a paper saying thank you. Or we've got Olson and his team who say. Sure, if you have a, a hypothesis that you want to test, we'll help you test that. I've got a biostatistician uh, on staff uh, and I do stats myself. Um, and you write the paper, you get, a, you get a first authorship. Now, some of them, they're not ready for first office, so maybe they're second, they partner. Um, I have a wonderfully supportive team at UT Southwestern. Um, my fellow neuro ICU nurses, uh, I think last count, 64% of the nurses in my neuro ICU have been on at least one publication. So we're we're trying to, to flip that script that way. Hopefully that answered your question. And what if somebody on the call today or somebody from the SIG wanted to participate? Besides, <laughs> besides just contacting you all your email so at the end of the presentation. Yeah, yeah, I love that question, Brady. In fact, I hadn't I hadn't thought about it. Had I thought about it, I would have I would have prompted you to ask it. <laughs> so let's let's pretend um, I see Barb Lutz's name there. Um, uh, let's pretend that Barb Lutz has a question. Now I cannot send you my data. It's not it's not we don't have IRB approval for that. All of the agreements we have are to send the data to us. But I can tell you what my variables are. And you can write a statistical analysis uh, plan, an SAP. One of the other things that's happened since this registry in the past three years is the biostatistics professors found out that Olson has a registry. <laughs> they have students who need to get their MPH final and they need a real world study. Mm. And so they're like, um, I got a student. Do you have any analyses that need to be done or something? And, and so <laughs> these are supervised by, by one or sometimes two PhD professors. And it's an MPH student who their, their final project so it's one of these, you know, if you build it, they will come kind of things. And um, so let's pretend Barb has this clinical question. She writes her SAP. We work together with a, um, a biostatistician. Barb writes the paper. She can be first author. Um, obviously, all of the people who contribute data have an option. I want to say one other thing, Brady. OK. Um, sorry. <laughs> Can't yeah. carry away. Great. Everyone here can also do this with all of the other national registries. Everyone listening to my voice right now <laughs> can be a first author on a get with the guidelines stroke analysis of 4 million patients. It's like this well-kept secret, right? You write the AHA and say, I want, I want to access all this get with the guidelines data. You've got 4 million patients. Now, it gets a little dicey because uh, 
there's a team that votes on whether your paper is going to be number one in line or number 140 in line. <laughs> there's still a little bit of politics within there, but, um, but that's true. And I bet that's true with lots of registries. Yeah. Okay. That's a good answer. And I think that's good information in general, but there's uh, another question in the box. Can you share whether you include pediatric patients? I don't, but <laughs> uh, uh, UT Southwestern literally is a small parking lot, uh, about maybe 120 feet wide between UT Southwestern and Children's Hospital. Oh, wow, I didn't so, actually realize that. So we don't get, we don't get kids. <laughs> we don't see any children at, at, at UT Southwestern. Again, though, the neurosurgeons go back and forth between both. Mm -hmm. And two years ago, they started going, um, can you help us? Oh, nice. And so we have our first PEDS paper was submitted um, about six days ago, actually. Oh, congratulations. So, so they want to try to figure out how to work together and things like that. So we're, we're working on that. Great. Wow, congratulations. Okay, one more from Patricia Hirschberger. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how you've been so successful in getting students involved in publication? For example, do you have a journal group, edit, editor, uh, other strategies? So um, the, uh, I'm, gonna be, I'm gonna be kind of blunt, honest with everybody here. Good. I think, um, I think the schools of nursing have done this wrong. <laughs> they, a lot of us got so high and mighty with, you know, God spoke unto Abraham saying, thou shalt first do a literature review that takes 17, you know, years to complete. And, and you look in every corner of the planet and, and then you're going to turn that into me as a professor. And I'm going to go, this sucks. This is horrible. This is crap. Throw this out. And then those, those people go, yeah, I, I got nothing. And they give up. We do a lot of handholding, especially at first, like a lot of handholding. Um, we walk them through where I go, okay, here's what I want you to do. And then, oh, and, but the short answer is that the reason we've gotten successful, I think, is because we started with one, we proved we can do it. I, yeah. I, I, I put my big mouth out there. I said, I can do this. You got to believe in me. And I'm like, yeah, we don't. Here's a throwaway student. <laughs> See what you can do. <laughs> and um, and that student became successful. They go, yeah, we think it's a fluke. Here's another one. We think they're an idiot. And I go, yeah, but they published. And they go, all right, now we'll give you two. And and um, and and so it adds up. So so you gotta you gotta win that that self bet. But we'll say to the students, okay, I want you to write one sentence, normal speech. Start with that. And and they write something like. Stroke is bad. I go, that's a great sentence. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's clean it up a little bit though. What kind of stroke do you mean? And they come back, they go, acute ischemic stroke is bad. Okay, that's awesome. Let's talk about bad. And you kind of build on that and you have, I have lots of templates. I have templates for everything. And, and they start to work on this template and they, they build it out and build it out. And uh, my research interns spend five hours a week in the research center. And our research center is uh, like 14 feet away from one of the ICU beds. I have a, a, a nice. space in the ICU. I've got uh, six cubicles. And then in the other hospital, I've got space for nine students. Um, so we're starting to, it, it, it's yeah, success builds upon success. Yeah. Okay, I think that's practical enough for us to be able to replicate. <laughs> Good, thank you. Uh, let's see, there are a couple other I comments. See, um, great comments in the uh, chat box. I'm not sure what you can see. Karen Ruder Rice, hi to you. And she's saying great to get hi, the nurses on. Yeah. Um, I think while you're looking at those, Brady, I also want to comment. One of the other things that's fairly unique about my program, Brady mentioned it's, it's the Neuroscience Nursing Research Center. 
when I first pitched this idea, the director of nursing, like I, I wrote a two and a half page, I think we should do this and handed it to my boss who was the chair of neurology, who I said, can you kind of look at this and tell me what you think? It wasn't finished, but he handed it to the, to the director of nursing who said, yeah, make it happen. And it was totally unfunded. Two years later, the hospital started saying, okay, but we don't want it to be neuroscience. We want it to be the whole hospital. We want you to be the director of nursing research. And I said, no. And they said, we'll give you more money. And I said, no. <laughs> By having it be focused on neuro, it's actually easier to be successful. So I'm targeting, instead of, of teaching 475 nurses how to do a lit review, I'm working a whole lot with six at a time. We've now, we, we're now at 204 nurses that have worked over the years, but I started six at a time. And what I've heard from other folks, and maybe this is a good chance for people to discuss is when you do a two hour lecture for 475 people that they watch on Taleo in the middle of their shift on how to do a lit review, nothing happens. Yeah. So, yeah. um, so it's a, a very different approach. Okay, that's good to hear about. Is there anything else uh, that you would say about the approach itself besides focusing energy on a kind of discrete, small cohort? Uh, yeah, yeah uh, I, I think that a lot of the things that when I'm, when I'm at the bedside and for the, you know, for the past 36, 37 years, when we talk about the about how nursing should be at 2 a.m. and you come up with these questions, those are actually pretty pretty great places to start. Some of those can be answered with my registry, and they have nothing to do with the pupil. But we happen to have I have every blood pressure ever taken in the intensive care unit for the past four years. Okay, you got a blood pressure question? We can answer it. This is not gonna be a JAMA level paper, right? But it gets them excited yeah. into, so um, in many ways, I think my large success is because I'm much more willing to grab the low hanging fruit. Well, that's great advice as well. Also, I think grabbing the low hanging fruit is, it's one way to look at it, but I think everything's relative. And when, when a student or a new, uh, a new nurse scientist publishes a paper, uh, what's low hanging fruit to you is, yeah, you know, yeah. the top of the tree to others. And so, you know, there are lots of ways to think about that. It's all good. You know, what you just reminded me of, Brady, is, is a great. I had one of my nurses in the neuro ICU that I work with. Um, we, we read, I won't tell you the article. We read an article and she hated it. Hated <laughs> it. She knew why it was wrong. Blah, 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 blah. I said, well, you should write a letter to the editor. <laughs> well, that's not going to do any good. Blah, blah, blah. So she wrote a, a, like a one and a half paragraph letter to the editor with two citations. This was about TPA versus Alta Place. And, oh, wow. um, and it, well, we're not supposed to say, I know you're not a stroke nurse, but we're not supposed to say TPA anymore. Those are dirty words. <laughs> we're supposed to say Alta Place and that's a big change. But anyhow, she wrote a letter to the editor and got published and you would have think she won the Pulitzer Prize. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I'm a published author, you know? Yeah. And uh -huh. as, as academics, we're not as hip for the whole. Uh, uh, but it's refreshing. It's, it's invigorating to, for other people to be excited about. The, it's great. Yeah. yeah, she was really, really excited about it. That's the whole, um, that's, that's the whole thrill of being able to mentor new people as a nurse scientist. 
Yeah, so uh, Patricia Hirschberger, our nurse, so the answer is yes, our nurse retention went up. I'll, I'll, I'll give a little bit more story to that. There's two, a couple things that happened. One, our nurses started staying longer. So our overhead was less because of turnover. Right. Um, and we had the, we had the highest uh, length of stay for nurses, nurse retention of any of the units. And then we, the nurse manager got the bug and we used some of, some of our data from, from uh, the registry. And then he got some other data that was when we got IRB approval, we matched these things together. And he demonstrated that our acuity, our staffing ratio was not congruent with our needs. And so he, he took this as data. Mm. He, pub he published his article and then took it as data to the hospital. And then we got a better staffing ratio. And then our, then our retention was like, kaboom. <laughs> um, and then literally on Monday, this past Monday, what? we moved our whole ICU to a new building. Ooh. And the hospital, because the neuro ICU was so well staffed, but COVID hit, they be assigned our, because the COVID unit, they had high turnover and they shifted things around. So I'm not sure how we, how, in fact, if anybody has a good idea, um, I'm not sure how we track our, our, our nurse retention numbers when the nurses didn't leave, they were reassigned. Right, right. So if anybody has any ideas for us, type them into the Hmm. I know someone who might have a good idea for that. Oh, good. I'll let you know. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Uh, any other questions? I'm juggling between the chat and the Q&A. I don't see any others. I don't know, Mary, Fran, is there, is there anything that you had on, uh, on your list that we needed to remember to ask? Um, no, I think this has just been a great presentation and great uh, ahas and learnings for all of us in many different ways, not just about a registry, but about different ways to excite nurses and to, to really um, engage them and improve nursing care and patient outcomes. Yeah, I think that's what it's all about. And it's more fun. Our nurses have, they're, they're not only working in the neuro ICU taking direct care. They're also adding to the body of knowledge. And, and anytime, anytime they disagree with something, they're in my office. It's the reassignment, perm the reassignment, Catherine Ivory, the reassignment is permanent. Keep tracking your outcomes to see how indicators. Yeah, so the other thing about that comment, Catherine, uh, thank you very much for that. We had been tracking Prescani and we're no longer using Prescani. And, and I don't know how much they track over, uh, but I do like, I mean, we're still tracking and we're building, the, the nurse manager thinks, uh, thinks they're gonna also build a registry by the way. So I don't, think, I don't think that's quite gonna happen. I don't know that they have the infrastructure for that, but, but they're hip. <laughs> Okay, well, it's time to wrap Nurses up. Get, oh, sorry. Mary Fran, let me ask. Let me let me answer Mary Franz real real quick. Oh, are okay. they are nurses given time to work on projects? Um, we have specifically designed our nurse driven studies, and and these are nurse PIs, where I will walk to the unit, whether they're on my own unit, which is a really short walk, or whether they're on other units, and I'll meet with them, and so will my other staff. But the time factor comes in in that they're it's a clinical ladder advancement. So they get more money. And, and I know at Duke, you used to get like eight hours as a CN4. Brady, can you talk about that? Maybe? Yeah, we still have the same um, structure, CN3s and 4s, which are, uh, well, most of the entry-level nurses are CN2s. And so 
uh, the threes and fours have advanced on the clinical ladder through various projects and uh, use, use of evidence or demonstration of new knowledge through projects. And yes, there is, a, there is an hourly, um, bi-weekly, hourly protected time to work on those projects. And then there's also an incremental pay benefit. So I think it's the same as when you left, which means that it's not a lot, but it is something. And I think it's, uh, I think it's a great benefit, to be honest. It, it's good. It gives people time and a little bit of extra money. So that's, I think it's a, a good incentive and people value that. Okay, so I just really thank you a lot, Dai Wai. It's been great to see your face and chat for a while and hear about your work and learn how to be involved. So thanks everybody for joining. Mary Fran and I appreciate so much um, the help of Rachel and the CANS group for, for broadcasting this and putting it on. And we, we look forward to our remaining activities for the year. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Dai Wai. Bye-bye.